like to start off, I don't like to just dive into a discussion like this without giving us some of the some of the context of what was going on. Without getting into all the weeds of it though, let's just say that for several decades prior to 1914, there had been some re there had been some some geopolitical shifting going on in Europe that basically gave us this, give us a map like this. You see, where Germany and Austria-Hungary dominated Central Europe. Otto von Bismarck had been, Otto von Bismarck, the one-time chancellor of Germany, the Iron Chancellor, his great goal had been to make Germany the dominant nation on the European continent. Not necessarily Great Britain, but Great Britain is not physically connected to the continent. Bismarck wanted Germany to be the dominant nation. He would do that by isolating Russia and making friends with France, if not isolating them both. He had an alignment with Austria Germany and had an alignment with Austria Hungary. By 1914, you have several power blocks that have been formed. The Triple on top, as so shown by the legend there, those comprised of the United Kingdom, France and its allies, and Russia, primarily. The Central Powers, primarily Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Bulgaria. Understand, Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungary was con con consisted of, just like it does today in the Balkans, many ethnicities, many histories. Consider this, that in Europe, in Europe, in that part of Europe what we call the Balkans, the same problems that caused warfare to break out in the early 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union, you've got thousands of years of invasions by the, until the Hun, Chinggis Khan, there are Muslims there, there are Greek Orthodox Christians, there are Catholics there, there are different people, there are people of Asian descent, Southern European descent, Mediterranean descent. There they have spoken at least one time or another, or sometimes all the time, all at once, Hebrew, Latin, Greek, and whatever, whatever Slavic languages they also had as well. So it is a great ethnic, religious, historical melting pot of trouble. Mobilization of 1914 is, if you all know anybody in the reserves or if you've been in the, been in the reserves, you know that when a military unit goes, goes on alert, that's where you're supposed to have your pack by the door and you're ready to move out at a moment's notice. That's what mobilization is. It is the first step toward war. So Russia mobilized. Russia was going to try and make Sir Austria back down. Austria responded with a mobilization of its own. And because the Austrians were allied with the Germans, the Germans then came to the aid of Austria against Russia. Germany had a plan that had been on the books for some years called the Von Schlieffen Plan, a plan by General Alfred Graf Von Schlieffen. The plan was in the event of war, the first thing that the, that the Germans meant to do, given, given one or two combatants, they figured it would be more profitable to neutralize France first. To do that, the Schlieffen plan called for going into Belgium through Luxembourg. But there was something called the Treaty of London, 1839. We never know what we're about to get into at the start of any war. But in 1914, they were especially ignorant about what they were about to get into. So you find pictures like this, people marching up the war in Germany, these young lads going off to enlist, in France, women throwing flowers, children running after them. They don't seem to be bothered at all, or not aware of the fact that they're about to go into a meat grinder. But understand, it is the limitation of, of mortal humanity. We can only know about that which has already happened. And that's why I mentioned to you that the last war they had fought on the European continent was the Franco-Prussian War. It lasted six weeks. It was between France and Germany. It was contained. It was brief. By war standards, kind of nice, nice, tidy, and clean. Maybe the next one will be like that, too. Plus, with the arrogance of we've conquered Africa, We've conquered technology. We've mastered flight. We've mastered the transcontinental tele tele uh, telegraphic cable. It was, for many people, the dawn of the golden era relative to technology and cost of living. Diseases were being wiped out. It looked like Western civilization and humanity was on the march. They would handle this as well. A good portion of the world was involved in World War I. All of Europe, 
on the African continent, you see right here, primarily, primarily France and Great Britain, they will use significant numbers of what they call their colonial troops coming from, from Africa to fight on the battlefields of Europe. Of course, the United States will get involved, and Canada, being part of the United Kingdom, will also participate. And Australia, as part of the UK, will send troops as well. This map from the Thirty Years' War, I have up here because some historians have said that from 1914 to 1918, Europeans will do in four years what it took them 30 years to do from 1618 to 1648. Europeans, Europe, is going to cause the same kind of heartbreak and discontent, or hatred and discontent, in four years that it took 30 years to accomplish from 1618 to 1648 during the Thirty Years' War. Now, on the one hand, it's obvious. In 1618, they don't have the technology, they don't have the wherewithal, they don't have the know-how. Even so, a three-decade war, and you achieve the equivalent destruction within four, that should tell us something about the level of ferocity of World War I. Those people went marching off, and by 1915, found out they were something called no man's land. And this is where humanity gets introduced to warfare, not with one, but with five different weapon systems. Warfare that, with warfare that is supported, waged by industrial technology and science, and it has to get better and better and better because after all, the objective is to defeat the enemy. And for every modification they make in a weapon system, you've got to do one better. To do that, you bring your engineers, you bring your mathematicians, you bring your scientists, you bring your bureaucrats to write the legislation, to make it possible, to set up the factories, to hire the workers, to train them to do all that, to produce the weapons, to put it to the hands of the soldiers on the battlefield, to get that edge. This is what they call going over the top in World War I when they came up out of the trenches. So let's talk about some of these weapons. I mentioned the machine gun. The machine gun was basically invented, or a, 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 a very usable version of it in 1884. It's called the Maxim gun. The Maxim gun. Now, the United States had used something like this during the, during the, the Plains Wars with the Native Americans. The United States had a very primitive form of machine gun during the Civil War, toward the end of the Civil War. Then there was the Gatling gun. But this Maxim gun was the first real machine gun, invented by Sir Hiram, Mac Hiram Stevens Maxim. You'll notice that it has, it's, it's primitive by today's standards, but it has just about all the major features and functions of a machine gun. A base, the ammunition box. This is another picture of Hiram Maxim. I think he's sitting on a, uh, on a seat there, because that was really painful. <laughs> By World War I, the British Vickers machine gun, now this was an actual machine gun. Now, of course, this thing was very effective, but given the technology of the time, some, 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 of, the, some of the Vietnam veterans will know some of the things that were going on with the M16A1 during Vietnam. It jammed very easily, not very reliable, it took years for them to come out with the M16A2 with the, with the more reinforced barrel, the hand guards, and you could, I'm not saying you could throw it in the mud, but it wouldn't jam up so quickly from, from slight amounts of dirt. This thing wouldn't work, but with the machine gun, you had to fire it, you couldn't fire it. There's no John Rambo firing of this machine gun. There's not gonna be long, long sustained bursts, and you're certainly not gonna hold it with one hand in your bulging bicep. <laughs> you fired this machine gun in short bursts, because it heated up very quickly. And early on, early models used were, were water-cooled. So imagine this, you're in the heat of battle, you have to have vast amounts of water to cool the weapon. And going back and doing some extra research on this, I discovered that when they ran out of water to cool it off, they would urinate on the thing. But if you're in the heat of battle, and it's you versus them, life or death, etc., you need the picture, you do what's required. Even so, even with all the deficiencies and weaknesses of, of this machine gun, this became the standard model for the British, and it was known, machine guns period, were known to be the arbiters to take vast numbers of death. As of the year, machine guns inflicted appalling casualties on both war fronts in World War I. 
Men went over the top. In trenches, still little chance when the enemy opened up with, up with their machine guns. Machine guns were one of the main killers in the war and accounted for many thousands of deaths. Crude machine guns have been used in the American Civil War, but the tactics from that war to 1914 hadn't changed to fit with this new weapon. They could shoot hundreds of rounds a minute, and the standard military tactic of World War I was the infantry assault or the charge, or the cavalry charge. Many soldiers barely got out of the trench before they were cut down. These could be used as offensive weapons, but they were also spectacular as defensive weapons. Just as an illustration, for those of you that saw the movie War Horse, or if you didn't see the movie War Horse, there's a scene in there where there's a cavalry charge with great dashing British soldiers are on their, are on their very you know, brave looking steeds and very quietly sneak through the, through the wheat fields. And then there's an order to charge. And off they go. And if you're, if you're a standard infantryman looking at a group of horses coming at you like this, you're probably worried at this point. And so the Germans, as they ride to the German camp, the Germans, of course, are fleeing. You see the German soldiers running into the tree line there. But inside that tree line, the Germans have set up defensive weapons called machine guns. Keep in mind, the British are in the attack. The Germans appear to be running away, surrendering. And then, they open fire. The carnage is inexplicable. There's a reason why we don't do cavalry charges anymore. This picture right here from the Battle of the Somme, 1916, you'll note that not only do these two British soldiers, not only are they manning a machine gun, but they're wearing a protective gas mask as well. We'll get to that. The French Hotchkiss model 1914 was a favorite for the, for the French. But again, you'll know that just like the Maxim gun, they have the mount, usually it's a team of individuals that are required to use a machine gun, usually somebody, to, the, the gunner, somebody to haul the ammo, and then somebody to make sure the thing stays cool. Another innovation for the battlefield that came about, barbed wire. Now this was originally invented in 1974 by an American farmer. By 1902, eight and other versions were widely used by many armies as a means of creating obstacles to impede advancing armies or troops. By 1914, barbed wire was a standard item the military defense schemes of all the major belligerents of the war. And then in 1917, the Germans introduced something called armored barbed wire, which could be more resistant to the destructive action of shelling. Let me hang on that for a moment, okay? Because I want, I want to make sure that I, I accent and underscore what I said about the ongoing te technological development. It's not just the barbed wire. So we have the barbed wire. Then the Germans modify it to produce barbed wire that will resist active shelling. That requires doing something with regard to research and metal and meshing the wire together and deploying it. So warfare is becoming not only more scientifically and technologically sophisticated, but the means of how you fight the war as well. Like a number of people, I, I, was, I spent years mystified, for example, why during the American Civil War did people stand in these bunches and mark with it, mark for them what seems to me ridiculous ranges of each other, when you feel you're gonna get shot. Why would they do that? The reason why is because they were firing smooth bore weapons. The round comes out of the, of the musket or the rifle such as it is, or the musket more than likely, it goes down a range. The moment it comes out the barrel, it starts to drop at elevation, it wobbles, it's very inaccurate. So the way to get most of your good shots during the Civil War was to mash your fire. How do you do that? You bust together. You shoot in mass. Then somebody does something called rifling the barrel. You elongate the bullet. It's not a ball anymore. As it comes out the barrel, it's spinning. It goes down range faster, farther, 
And when it hits the impact, it's a lot harder. It's more accurate. Guess what they had to stop doing? Marching around in big human squares. They invent a phrase called, take cover. So tactics change with weapons development. And this is our wire. This is what made the no man's land of World War I, in addition to everything else. This is what made it hell. Because when you come over the top, not only do you come over the top knowing that you have machine guns there waiting to mow you down, but now there's barbed wire which is strung for miles everywhere. The whole purpose is to impede your movement, to slow you down. So soldiers develop different techniques like taking a piece of cloth or something hard, or some soldiers would be, would be designated to literally dive on top of the barbed wire so their comrades could climb over them, use them basically as a human bridge to get across. I think that World War I was more of a shock to the humanity's nervous system. It's very similar to what I think took place for many of our soldiers in World War II. Understand that in World War II, our young men and women who went to fight in, you know, in the Pacific and in the European theater, they weren't from cities for the most part. It's not until the, it's not until the census of 1950, after World War II, where when the census is taken that year, when the results come back, it's shown for the first time that you have more Americans who are living in cities rather than small towns and farms. Which means then that the generation that fought, that went to fight in World War II came from places like Muskegon, Holland, Grand Haven, small town people. And their experiences simply did not prepare them to walk into places like Buchenwald, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen to liberate people who had been purposely, systematically starved, beaten, bludgeoned, and just basically driven into death's arms as a plan of a regime like the Nazis. They weren't prepared for that. And I submit to you that I think that relative to this kind of warfare, humanity simply was unprepared for what it suddenly found itself in the midst of. We know intellectually war has always been miserable, but this was misery on a scale that nobody had seen before. And it only kept getting worse. Another technique. Clearly, this person presents a good target. Then January 1, 1917, Flanders, Belgium. These were the French who were leasing a gas attack against, against German soldiers. Fritz Haber, who lived from 1868 to 1934. Fritz Haber was a chemist. And before World War I, as Radio Lab reported, the Germ Germans, like a lot of other countries, had a problem. They had plenty of sunshine, but the technology to feed its growing population, there are many people who are going to be starving. They couldn't figure out a way to do something called putting nitrogen in the soil. They didn't have the chemical to do that. In other words, they didn't have the chemical know-how to create today what we refer to as fertilizers. It's no big deal to us because fertilizers have been around, I guess, for all of our lifetimes. But Fritz Haber came along and did something called fixing nitrogen and it produced ammonia. And it turns out that the technique that he used for fixing nitrogen became an ingredient that was good for manufacturing agricultural fertilizers as well as explosives. So on the one hand, Fritz Haber is, is seen by many people as a hero and he revolutionized agriculture so that you know, when human beings can feed each other, they can have better diets, they can live longer, populations expand, whether that be a good or a bad thing, I don't know, but they can expand, they can, nations can feed their populations. But Fritz Haber also went on to throw his energies into developing a new weapon in 1915 called chlorine gas. When he released it on in 1915 at Ypres, or Ypres in Belgium, his wife confronted him about this. She too was a chemist, a PhD chemist. And when she, when she confronted him, telling him that he either had lost his moral compass or had no moral compass, he basically just ignored her and she took her life because she was so despondent about what he was doing. As you note here, that next to the last bullet, there was great consternation when he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1918 for his synthesis of ammonia from its element. 
Because the people who couldn't understand why this man was getting the Nobel Prize, remember that he was the one who basically invented the, the, the chlorine gas. And of course, when it was released at the free, the French and the Germans, or the French and the British, did likewise. I was telling my students, if you're going to study history, you have to learn to love irony. The other thing about Fritz Haber was that he was a Jew. So being a Jew after World War I and subsequent to the rise of the Nazis, even someone as brilliant as Fritz Haber, his brilliance was that absolutely no concern to the Nazis. What was a concern to them was that he was a Jew. He had to leave the country. And he had a dying, a wandering, broken, penniless man. But the legacy of the invention of gas, another one of those weapon systems, <coughs> meant now that soldiers, in addition to the barbed wire, in addition to the, to, to the certainty of being gunned down by machine guns, now you might have your eyes burning, your lungs liquefying, or your throat being burned, or skin getting blisters on it. I can assure you, that having worn what they call the mop suits, those, 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 all that gear where you had to put on the big boots and cover yourself up with gloves, you had to wear all, all that equipment in preparation, in preparation for a gas attack, in addition to your helmet, your weapon, your ammunition, and whatever you're carrying in your pack. Blisters from mustard gas. Blinded by tear gas attack. Mustard gas casualty. Machine guns, barbed wire, gas. Then there was another weapon system, the airplane. On December 17, 1903, after years and years and years and years of time, trying and theorizing, two Bicycle mechanics, builders, tinkers, Wilbur and Wilbur Wright, successfully flew. They're playing at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the Wright Flyer. Two years later, the Wright Flyer three, showing a lot more, more a lot more advancement in capability than, than that original model, clearly. By 1911, a young man named Eugene Burton Ealy had an idea. Could an airplane land and take off from a ship? So in 1911, he set up a, a series of demonstrations to determine whether or not it could be done. So on January 18, 1911, Eugene Ealy, you see him right here, he's coming in for a landing on the USS Pennsylvania. Now the ship is the ship is anchored. It's not moving like an aircraft carrier normally would be. You see, he's got a wooden landing deck. So he lands successfully aboard the Pennsylvania. So now we know that a plane can land on board a ship. Later on, after some greeting from dignitaries, military, and political officials, it's time for Eugene Neely to take off. I was telling my students that at this point, Eugene Ely was probably thinking to himself, this wasn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but the plane stayed aloft. And it was proven that planes could land and take off of ships. A generation later, that technology would prove itself more than worthy, as I mentioned already, at Pearl Harbor. But I mentioned this only to say, now before I get any further, Eugene Ely will eventually crash in Macon, Georgia, later on, 1911. But air power introduced another element, another element of modification and struggle into a larger struggle during World War I. In World War I, London was bombed by the Germans, and of course the British tried to bomb German cities as well. But I have this here just to show from uh, a British 
Memorial. These premises were totally destroyed by a Zeppelin raid. The Zeppelins were the big, the big airships. Think of the Goodyear, think of the Goodyear blimp, just many times larger. And so these bombing raids that the Germans were staged from these airships, they were slow, they were very inaccurate. I read accounts where they literally sometimes held the bomb outside the window with their hands and dropped them. So there's none of that business where you have electronic guidance systems and, and wind direction and all that. It's just like, are we over the target? Yes, well, let it go then. A painting of a, of, a, of a Zeppelin. Now, this is not one of the Zeppelins, but this is, in the 1930s, the United States commissioned the building of several airships, what they call rigid airships, rigid airships. This is the USS Akron. There's another called the USA. There was another one called the USA Shenandoah. Now this air dock right here, this big hangar, this big black hangar building, this thing is still standing in Akron, Ohio. As a matter of fact, I used to work right in that facility. It's been designated as a historic landmark by the National Archives. But I wanted to show you all this so you can, you can get an idea of how big these things were. And again, it provides some scale. Look at one of the airships over Manhattan Island. You're not going to miss that if you're on the island of Manhattan. Those Zeppelins and their bombing missions will eventually give way to the Ju-87 Stuka dive bombers that the Germans used with great effectiveness at the beginning of World War I and their assault on Poland and then when they rolled across Western Europe. Now, these things are slow at the start of World War II. They proved to be very vulnerable, very ineffective by 1942-43, but in 1939, they're terror weapons. Also, those Zeppelins bombing civilian cities, bombing civilians from the air. Understand, that's new in World War I. It's not new today, but it's new in World War I. And that will eventually give way to not only the Ju-87 Stuka, but also aerial platforms like the B-17 bomber, that great workhorse of the Allied bombing campaign in 19, of the 1940s, or World War II, particularly 1943, Schweinfurt, Regensburg, and other raids. By 1943, we had the merging of civilian and military targets. We must destroy this bearing factory at Schweinfurt. There may be civilians working there. That may be true, but the German Army and the Air Force is a mechanized machine. If it doesn't have any ball bearings, tank tracks can't roll, propellers can't spin. We can bring everything to a halt. It's a target, therefore. The people that, that the fact that civilians have to be inside those buildings is incidental to the larger military fact. Now, this freshman right here named Rolling Girls. This Type L aircraft is flying. Roland Garros developed a way of modifying the propeller on this aircraft so that the machine gun he fired from the Ford, the, the Ford mounted machine gun would not destroy the propeller. In 19, I believe it's in 1915, a German engineer, I can't even call his name right now, but a German engineer would develop a synchronization mechanism, what they call a brake, an intermittent brake, that will fire bullets Every in between each propeller rotation. It's just ingenious stuff. Some of the more effective aircraft, fighter planes during World War I, the Flocker triplane, identified mostly by, by, as being associated with Germany, the Southwest Camel, identified with Great Britain, and the Spad 13, flown mostly by the French. This is the aircraft that the Lafayette Escadrille, those American flyers who went to fly with the French in World War I, Eddie Rickenbacker also flew an aircraft like this. And just to give an idea, Manfred Brown Richthoff, and some of you probably heard of him, he was the Red Baron. He painted his Falker triplane red. And Eddie Rickenbacker had at least 26, 26 confirmed kills. When he, joined this, when he joined this air unit, he was 27 years old. And most of the men in his unit called him an old man. They thought he wasn't fit. I've had a birthday recently, and 
You know, every time I hear that somebody is 27 years and old, I feel like punching the people that say that. <laughs> then the submarine. These are extremely controversial. The mindset of warfare had to change with each, with each year. And one of the things that will eventually draw the United States into war against the Germans is the undersea campaign or the, or the unrestricted submarine warfare. Understand, the Germans are at war with the British and the French. The Americans during World War I were for a time selling supplies to both. The British responded by mining the North Sea. The Germans responded by a submarine campaign. Woodrow Wilson went back and cited something from 1798 talking about neutrality and freedom of the seas, and the Germans and the British both responded by saying, are you kidding? They were fighting for their lives. But to give you an idea of how things had to change, how humanity had to catch up with the reality of the war they were fighting, submarines were seen as being ungentlemanly cowardly to sneak up on a ship, and then to pop up at the last minute and they fire a torpedo. Now such is the nature of World War I submarines that they, their torpedoes and their guidance systems and their aiming systems were very inaccurate. So most of the time when they attacked, it was a surface attack, which of course left them vulnerable. On May 7, 1915, a British ship called the Lusitania was sunk by a submarine. This caused great outrage, great outrage in the United States. This race right up there, it's not as, it's not as famous as the Titanic sinking, but it's not too far below, maybe, maybe number three as far as uh, maritime disasters in the early part of the 20th century. So as noted here, the ship near the coast of Ireland at 2.10 in the afternoon, a torpedo fired by the German submarine, U-20 slammed into her side. A mysterious second explosion ripped the liner apart. Chaos reigned. The ship listed so badly and quickly that light bulbs crashed into passengers crowded on the deck. 114 Americans lost their lives. Wilson sent a protest to the German government. One thing that the British did in response was to build or deploy a weapon called Q-ships. Q ships. Q ships were merchantmen that were modified to have dead guns. So when you have a German submarine which is going to surface and close in for the kill, a submarine is most vulnerable when it's on the surface. So as it closes in for the attack, then all of a sudden they deploy their guns on the side. They start shooting. As this painting depicts. So they were drafted into wartime service, armed with concealed heavy weapons, and set up to lure enemy submarines into combat. In other words, looking like a merchant ship, in other words, looking like a big fat target, when the submarine surfaced and got in close enough, the submarine was exposed, they're actually the target. If they close within range to fire a torpedo, and because the torpedoes are so inaccurate, because they run out of steam so quickly, they have to get close to, in order to stand a good chance of getting a kill. If you're going to get in that close, it's better for the gunners on board the, the Q ship. They tried to deploy Q ships during World War II, but by then German submarine technology, everybody's submarine technology had gotten so good that the Q ships were basically retired. I'll say a little bit more about tanks in just a little bit. Let me, let me continue on with the other part about, and I'll talk about this the next time I come up on the 27th, the psychological, emotional, spiritual impact of the war. But there's something that World War I also does, and it happens in all conflicts. It happens in all conflicts. But again, it's the organized effort and the focused intent of the government to make sure that the enemy is painted in the worst possible light, to dehumanize the enemy. And sometimes the thing that the enemy does they're not, they don't, you don't have to work too hard to dehumanize the enemy when they're acting like they're not human. And so what goes on in Belgium, when the Germans invaded Belgium, one of the reasons why, why Herbert Hoover 
became so well known was because of the, of the food or the, the food relief he organized from America to send to Europe to help refugees from Belgium. Just a great organizational genius, a great organizational skill. But the Germans they pillaged and plundered in Belgium, and of course it became a cost of that for buying war bonds. Look at this. You can't get much more obvious than this. Germany dressed up as an ape, wearing the Kaiser helmet with militarism across the top. There's the, the suffering, hardly clad form of Europe. Kultur. Otto von Bismarck had weighed something called the Kulturkampf, the cultural struggle. The message here, it's culture versus culture. If they win, we lose. And look what's at stake. Your wife, your daughter, your children. What will happen if the Hun, with, their, with blood up to their elbows, wins this conflict? We tend to forget sometimes, or maybe I think we need to do a better job of remembering, that at 11 a.m. on November 11, the 11th, the 11th hour of the 11th day on the 11th month of 1918, when the war ended, sure, the shooting stopped. But friends, I hope you can see now of what we've been talking about here, that the process of cleaning up from 1984 was going to be a long, miserable affair. There were going to be bodies to pick up from Moscow all the way to Paris. Whole villages wiped out. Created landscapes, a moonscape, a true no man's land. And the human cost, the human cost of the war would go on for several decades. In World War I, they learned about something called trench foot. You see in the, in the trenches, when it rained, the water has no place to go. If you're in water all that time, it does something to your feet. Our soldiers and Marines and sailors were encountered this in the Pacific as well. I can tell you that in the Marine Corps, they're always telling you, change your socks, change your socks, change your socks. Any of you have been in the infantry, you've heard that same mantra. Keep a clean pair of socks. Because of trench foot. Gay green, if you don't treat it, amputation for certain if it goes unchecked. Rats in the trenches. The carnage of having to live side by side. From artillery barrages, machine guns, mines, grenades, like the curator was talking about, the long handle grenades. What barbed wire is capable of doing? Imagine the psychological impact on these young 19 and 20 year olds, 17, 18, 19 year olds. They can't unsee this. And this is at a time when the term post traumatic stress disorder is not even invented. From World War I, they'll develop a term where they'll have a term called shell shock. In World War II, it'll be called combat fatigue. It's only after Vietnam it becomes PTSD. In World War I, men who suffer psychological problems because of what they've been through, they're basically said to be cowards and not doing their duty. So instead of getting treated, they're maligned. But that is because they knew not what kind of animal upon whose back they had climbed when the war started. Here, gas masks, hearing devices, hearing aids, a big gun. This is what I mean about the merging of the sciences, industry, government, logistics, and human effort. And always, refugees, the human cost of the war, the injuries, there was a small industry that came up by at the end of World War II, World War I, when these soldiers who came back with severe disfigurements in their faces, there was no reconstructive surgery. It was very 
well, not what it is today. So there was an industry of people that went around designing masks for their faces to hide their injuries, as in the case of this young man. The lost limbs. The reason why I had to revise the way, the way, the way I thought about World War I was because for years and years and years, I looked at Neville Chamberlain and Edouard Deladier. Neville Chamberlain was the Prime Minister of England prior to World War II. Edouard Deladier, who was the, the leader of France prior to World War II, I looked upon them as cowards. But when I started taking a closer look at World War I and seeing what, seeing what those men had gone through, I understood clearly even with a thug like Adolf Hitler, why, if you could just give him the Sudetenland, if you could just give him Czechoslovakia, of course it's not a noble thing to do, but if that will buy you peace, that's still better than what you went through in 1914. The only problem was they were working with somebody who never intended to keep the peace. So as I mentioned, the war ended on November 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m. The 11th day, the 11th hour, the 11th month. You have George Clemenceau, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, Victoria Orlando, the British Prime Minister, Lloyd George. The narrative that will come up in Germany after the war is that they were stabbed in the back by a Jewish conspiracy. It will give rise with the impact of reparations, the desperation of respira res reparations, the anger of losing the war, the dishonor of losing the war. The, the German delegation to the 1919 Versailles Peace Conference, they were told, they were under the impression, they were sure they had every reason to believe that the rhetoric of Woodrow Wilson about being treated fairly and equitably at Versailles was going to happen. But when they got there, they were told, they were informed that they not only were going to be held responsible for the war, they were forced to sign something called Article 231, which was making them take full responsibility for the war, in addition to being occupied, in addition to paying reparations. Difficulties hit economically in the 1930s. A German soldier from the war. The one with the X over his head. Remembered very clearly. We were going to need a lot more crosses. And this is why I have concluded that as an event of human history, as a thing or a time, an event that happened where nothing was the same anymore, I think World War I qualifies as that. Imagine that. Five new weapon systems, or six if you include barbed wire, the airplane, the tank, the machine gun, gas, and the other way. The submarine. Thank you. It would have been hard enough dealing with one, but all five, it helps explain why the war lasted for the duration that it did and the scale of carnage and destruction that it achieved. Let me say this in closing. Herman Wolf, a Jewish author who wrote the book The Winds of War and then War in Remembrance. I think, I think it's in the forward of the second book, War in Remembrance where he says that when stories started getting out to the West, Great Britain and the United States, about the horrible atrocities going on in Eastern Europe at the death camps, people knew. But he says that what people engaged in was the will to not believe. 
Because in 1942, humanity simply had not experienced a thing. Now, it's not that humanity hadn't experienced genocide. There was the Armenian genocide of 1915. There had been attempts to wipe people out. But an attempt to wipe people out using every apparatus of the state as a policy of official documentation to eliminate people on the basis of the, of the fact that they exist, part of your wartime strategy is to wipe out an entire group of people, to harness your rail systems, your industrial systems, industrialized killing. And Herman Wu says that when people were confronted with that reality, they simply chose not to believe it. It was inconceivable. But when British and Russian and American troops liberate those camps in 1944 and 1945, it becomes all too possible to believe it. And today, now 20 years after the 1994 Rwanda genocide, where 800,000 people were slaughtered in 100 days, it's still a terrible, terrible thing, but we're not surprised anymore. So, we have work to do. And this is just, again, to echo what the curator said, this is the value of history. There are weapon systems that we're using right now, drones, robots, robot carriers for the battlefield that are changing warfare as I speak. And the question becomes, if I'm sitting in a room 9,000 miles away, launching an airstrike, what does that do to my concept of warfare? Don't misunderstand me. There are bad guys out there that need to be dealt with. But how shall we, if we have to prosecute war, how are we going to go about doing that? How do we go about prosecuting warfare and not losing our humanity in the process? Thank you.